Hello, everyone. This is part two, episode 56 of the Fitness Business Growth Podcast, Selling to Beginners Over 40s and Over 50s. I'm with Mitch again, mate. How are you? Good, mate. Part two. I'm excited. Part two. I just want to recap what we discussed in episode one, something that is near and dear to our heart, which is marketing to beginners over 40s, over 50s, and our six audiences. But it is undeniable. We both agree, categorically, no discussions, selling to beginners over 40s and over 50s is a lot easier than to selling someone who is really experienced in the gym, already training. Mitch, do you want to start? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because I'm predominantly the one that's always talking about sales. Yeah, so it carries on from what we were saying in the, the last last podcast from like a marketing perspective, but now applying it from a sales perspective, a lot of the same principles remain remain consistent. So feel as though for, for people who aren't in that beginner, cate- beginner category, uh, perhaps they're a little bit younger uh, and can transition in and out of programs and into different gyms, they're not the ones we're really wanting to market to. But also from a selling perspective, a lot of the selling for those people is actually going to be based off program, facility, location, price, all of those logistical things as opposed to what we're talking about with beginners and older people, which is actually changing their life, helping them get healthier, lose weight, get stronger, all that good stuff. Because the other person, they're not really looking for anything too drastic. They're just looking for somewhere new to train or or looking for the next phase in their program. 100%. And when you're marketing to beginners and you have a sales call with a beginner over 40s, over 50s, you are the category king. You'll position yourself as the only facility in town that can help that person achieve XYZ goal for XYZ reason. Therefore, the discussion is more based around them, their goals. And typically, beginners over 40s and over 50s have a bigger pain. Therefore, they will pay a higher price. There's also more urgency for them to act compared to a 21-year-old who's already at an F45 who wants to incorporate a barbell into her program. It's just a way different call. And you've been on plenty of them. I've been on plenty of them. People listening have probably been on them where you've got someone who is really like me or you would be or, or the, the people listening. They're actually just looking as to what the price is, what's your equipment, what's the programming like, you know, what does it, what does the session look like? And it's actually important for people who are already training and maybe they're wanting to change. Mate, I would be the worst person to sell to. If I had a phone call from Plus Fitness or Jets, I would ask them, do you have hammer strength equipment? Do you have life fitness equipment? Because as I know, that is the best equipment that bodybuilders, and I'm not a bodybuilder, but I do my best, that they try to use because the other equipment just isn't as good. And it It's is- the same, sorry, it's the same way that CrossFitters would ask about Concept 2. Yeah, Rogue. And I remember when we bought one of our gyms, it was uh, not a CrossFit gym, but it was a CrossFit knockoff. And the old owner said, oh, yeah, this is, I don't even know the name of the brand. It wasn't Rogue, but, oh, this rig is you know, a really good rig and we have people really loving the rig. It's like, yeah, okay. Like maybe if they have come from another CrossFit gym and they used to rip their hands. So it's just a totally different call. And a lot of what we teach uh, in sales and, and what you know we're sort of doing with our team is we're not talking about those people. Every now and then we get those calls. Sometimes we make sales, sometimes we don't, but you just can't create enough need for them to want to join because if they don't join, they're probably just going to keep going where they're going or they're going to go somewhere else and trial there. It's more at that point you're comparing price, you're comparing hours, you're comparing you know location and convenience, and that's not really a conversation we want to be involved with for the most part because you're not going to win a whole lot of them. Well, if, you have, if you've got CrossFit Gym A, CrossFit Gym B, they're both in the exact same location. They both have Concept 2. They both have beautiful gyms, beautiful facilities. If one is priced $10 less than the other one, the younger person who doesn't give a shit where they go, they will always choose the cheaper option. And why wouldn't they? But if you're marketing towards a beginner or an over 40s, over 50s, someone that wouldn't feel comfortable in CrossFit Gym A or CrossFit B, they'd come to Breakthrough Active, they'd pay a higher price and they'd sign a contract and they'd refer their friends because it's the first great experience they've ever had in a gym. We, we often talk about that like with our, our own personal gyms where 
we don't really have that much competition, which might sound stupid, but we've done a lot, a lot of sales calls, you know, by this point. And even back when we were in the boot camp days, we used to you know, do consultations and there wouldn't really be people shopping around. There would just be like, are you going to do this or are you going to do nothing? That's kind of what it, what it, yeah. came, de- what, what it came down to. Whereas when you've got people price shopping or, or they are literally, you know, looking around other locations, then they are comparing gym A to gym B to gym C to gym D. And then you may be lucky enough to get one of, you know, be one of five that, that they choose for a convenience reason or the price or something else. But for us, we've always found that we don't really have that many people doing that. And like I said, it's like they are going to commit to our program and do this or they're not going to do anything. And that's the type of sales call we like to be on. Mate, I want to myth bust. I think Google leads suck for gyms. I think they're terrible. Because the person who is looking for a particular type of gym or particular type of fitness, that person will Google gym in Adamstown. That person will then also submit 10 lead forms. That person will also get 10 different prices. That is the person that is shopping around, right? Why Facebook ads, why social media ads are king for gyms, in my opinion, is you can put the right offer in front of the right person with the right copy, the right image, the right headline. They weren't look, looking to begin with. Click, learn more, book in a call. They're in a sales process. 24 hours later, Bob's your uncle. They're a member. Google ads, I think, would be more effective for like your, your big box club that has all the inclusions and it's 20 bucks a week. And that's where if you're comparing that to a group training facility that charges 60 or $70 a week and you get nothing else, it's going to be pretty obvious what that person's going to want to do. It's the biggest lie in fitness marketing. Google leads are more qualified. They're also more curious and people that are curious are detail oriented. And if you know anything about sales, detail oriented people are the absolute worst when they're literally questioning, oh, does you, do your dumbbells go up to 50 kilos or 60 kilos? <laughs> and, and then it's kind of based off, their decisions based off location, it's based off convenience, it's based off price, it's based off timetable. And all of those things obviously are important, but they're not basing it off the fact that am I going to be able to get the best result in this facility or this program or, you know, whatever that looks, they're basing it off all the other stuff, which a lot of gyms spend a lot of money on. And if they're able to get some members because of that, then they quite honestly do deserve them. But the gyms we work with and our gyms, like we don't have these, you know, multi-million dollar clubs. And that's where we need to be trying to market and sell to these people that aren't really caring about that. They're worried about getting a result and being healthier, losing weight, getting stronger. I think it's accepting that like a boutique gym compared to a 24 hour gym or a fitness cartel or an EFM, EMF, sorry, it is a different business. EMF might have 25 investors. They may have purchased the $3 million building. They may be paying off the mortgage, mortgage, trying to get the capital growth on the building. When the local gym owner with a local CrossFit gym, they're trying to get cash in their bank account tomorrow. It, well, it, it is apples and oranges. It is not. It is actually not the same thing. Well, this is a bit of a, a bit of a stretch, but it's kind of like comparing McDonald's or KFC to Hungry Jacks to a lo- local Thai shop. Like, yes, they both sell food. Yes, you can go to dinner to both of them. But exactly to your point, you've got one that is looking at the absolute long term play and whatever happens today or this week or this year has little to no bearing on on the success of the business where the local tie shop, they need to be earning money today and this week to be able to pay their staff. So those examples can be comparable to the, the fitness industry where, yes, you are getting fitness, but that's about as far as the similarities go. Well, an investor will purchase a, a 24-7 gym, right? I'll spend a million dollars and they're trying to beat the stock market. They're trying to get more than 9%. When gym owners that we work with, they're trying to pull $100,000 out and put it in their bank account. Again, apples and oranges, they're not the same thing. Yeah, and that's where the, the similarities stop that you can go in there and you know do fitness, lift weights, you know, insert whatever the modality is, and that's as far as it goes because on the back end of it, there's a whole different marketing approach. There's a whole different sales approach. And even the whole usage rate, like we know that those big gyms make money off the 80 to 90% of people who don't come. And Yeah, and we make money off the 90% that do come. 
Yeah, and, and, and that's where you need them to come. Otherwise, they're going to cancel their membership because it is expensive. So it, it's complete, not expensive, but it's it's of good value, but it's more expensive than, than the normal rate. But it, that's where it's, a, it's just such a different model than, um, than what we generally work with in three-hour gyms. And if you think about it logically, you've got a young 21-year-old girl confident to exercise any way she sees fit. You've got fitness cartel, you've got World Jam, you've got EMF, $20, 24-7 access, group sessions, sauna, ice bath, Pilates, two different types of, of equipment. They've got Gym Tech 180, they've got Hammer Strength, they've also got Techno Gym. Why in the world would that young, confident person join our gym for three times the amount of money offering way less? It all comes back to like the people that join boutique gyms, they're not just joining for the equipment. They're joining for something bigger, which is to be a part of a community, which is to to make friends because they don't feel confident walking to those gyms. Well, the underlying thing is that people who join boutique gyms, for the most part, if they had a membership to that other studio, that other gym that had all those inclusions, they wouldn't even step through the door. So they wouldn't be getting value anyway because they're so that begs the question. Man. So I'm, I'm, I'm jump in there, mate. That begs the question. Then why the hell are they joining our gyms? Because they've probably trialed and failed before. They've tried the Anytime Fitness. They've tried something else. And why did they fail? Because they had no accountability. They had no support. They didn't know what to do. They lost motivation after two weeks because they didn't have someone, I guess, scaling their their workout or following them up or ensuring that this is part of the process. And that's actually it in a nutshell. We're not selling the equipment. We're not selling the facility. We are selling accountability. We are selling, hey, if you don't come this today, you will get a message from one of our friendly trainers to get you back on the wagon. Because like it or not, people need to be back on the wagon every two weeks. If they get sick, they go on holidays, whatever the case may be. Any small change in their life can lead to them missing a week, turns to two weeks, turn to three weeks. Cancellation. We need to get them in the door. And you just can't be everything to everyone. And I think where a lot of people's disconnect comes from is a lot of people who own gyms, like us, are in their 20s or 30s. You know, we, we started when we were in our 20s and now we're in our 30s. And they have a certain style of training or they have, they've never had too much of an issue you know, getting into the gym. Their friends go to a certain gym and their network, they're not really doing that. So then they think, okay, well, we're, we're going to have, we're going to try and get more people like us. You know, like me, okay? And that's where that is the worst mistake you can make because you don't have any issue getting into the gym. So if you were on the other end of the sales or the marketing, you would not join your own gym. And that's something that you don't need to say, oh, I would have joined it because of this and that. You wouldn't have. You, you've never done a CrossFit session in your life. And, not or, me. Or, not or, me. Or, <laughs> but, 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 that, but that's okay though. Like it, it's it's just... Because I've got the discipline to go to Anytime Fitness 90 minutes every day for how long now? Like 18 you, years or something. You can't be everything to every everything to everybody. So why why would we, we be trying to market and sell to people like you who the, the service just simply isn't for? But in 20, and obviously maybe not you specifically, but someone of our age in their 30s in 10 years' time, 20 years time maybe they haven't been as consistent with their training like they were in their 20s and 30s maybe they do feel a bit anxious and overwhelmed because they are overweight they they don't really know what they're doing anymore they've had some injuries do you think they're going to feel comfortable walking into the gym when they're 50 the same way that when they were 25 or 30 like, absolutely not i say it all the time mate we are not trying to get people from f45 into our gym we are trying to get people off the couch that's the largest market. If 8% of people are active users of gyms, we're going after the 92%. And luckily for us, those 92% aren't as marketed towards as those 8%, because those 8% get bombarded with every single gym's ads in town. And here's one to scratch your noggin over, mate. If someone joins F45, they leave, they go to Rebel, they leave, they go to BFT, they leave, they go to Pit Stop, they leave, they go to Air Locker, they leave, they go to the next thing. If you are basing your product and your experience off what you actually do in this session and nothing else, they're always going to chase the next fad. 
Pilates, for example, when if you work towards beginners and over 40s and over 50s and you become the category king, one of one, the only place they can go, you're going to have members for years and years and years and years and years. And in 2024, it's harder than ever. Members are harder than ever to come by. You need to keep them for as long as possible. The fitness market, the the 8% that you're talking about that are already part of something, they're fickle. And and what I mean by fickle is they are not loyal to the, the gym that they go to. I think any owner listening to this has more than one experience where they've had someone who was the biggest raving fan of their program, three months, six months, 12 months, maybe it was 24 months later, they're moving on to the next thing because they're... Mate, let me paint the picture. X member. 200 sessions congratulations the entire community gets around them we're all so proud new franchise opens up on the corner about two weeks later they're doing a pre-sale by the way 10 percent off a little bit cheaper than your membership to whom it may concern I like like that's happened to you right because it's happened to us and that is why we made this change and again i'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here and if someone does do 200, 400, 500 sessions in the one place and then they want to try something different, can you really blame them? Can you really blame them? <laughs> like it, it is unrealistic to think that they're going to be with you forever. Not to mention that that person may have started with you when they were 29 and now they're 34 and they've got two kids. Maybe they do want to go to the gym at 8 o'clock at night because I know I'm a new dad and my, my schedule's changed. So things actually do change for people. Mm. So the, the thought that you're going to have someone forever is, is ridiculous. So long way away, long round way to say that that 8% of people that are already going, they're always going to be looking at other things around. And unfortunately, because of the nature of what fitness is and people want to try something new, because it is a big part of people's life. They're going three, four, five times a week if they're already active. The thought of going somewhere different, maybe it is different equipment, different four walls, different music, different workouts, maybe it's 60 minutes instead of 45 minutes, it can be appealing. And they, what, again, I'll say, like, can you really blame them for wanting and if to you are that try arrogant, something else? If you are that arrogant that you think that your workout is so much better than everyone else's workout, and that's the only reason they're with you, then you're barking up the wrong tree. Because Sally, Loves Anne at the 6 a.m. session. Sally and Anne go out for coffee after 6 a.m. All of a sudden, they're going to the park on the weekend with their kids. They're coming to the gym for the community. They're not coming there for your hip hinge, for your thoracic rotation, for any other thing that you put in your marketing that you think is going to attract that 8% of people. And, mate, going right back to the start, good luck selling those people. Like, good luck. So I sold 26-week programs for $3,000, $3,800 over the phone, and I struggled to sell those people because if your price tire, your workout's not special, it just doesn't compute. You're not selling based off results at that point. Like you're based off, hey, like, oh, you live 200 meters from the gym? You want to come? Yeah, that's (laughs) convenient. Sounds good. Like. Honestly, like that's that can be the decision why some of those people they want to join because they move to the area. And 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 honestly and obviously there is like an element to this where when you're picking your location, if you are in an area where there are a lot of, you know, X, Y, and Z people, it's close to a, a business district or it's close to, you know, a big hub of employment, or there are a lot of families or something there, yes, you are gonna get the gimmies of people that live nearby and they come and join. Like picking your location is very important. But you're not going to be able to have those sales conversations with people who are already training and sell on goals, sell on actually helping them because they're going to be basing their decision off you know, one of the other 10 things that has nothing to do with them getting in shape or staying in shape and then feeling like that you're the only option for them. Last episode, we mentioned Bedros Koulian, one of our heroes. I want to reference our other hero, Alex Amosi, and I want to reference maybe our biggest competitor, the gym launch. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that every single personal trainer, every single gym owner, every single franchise founder has a massive amount of admiration for Alex Homosi. Agree or disagree? Agree. What does Gym Launch tell you to sell on? Results. So if you have this admiration for Alex Homosi, you have admiration for everything he's done and Gym Launch, as do we, 
And seven years later, Jim Walsh is the biggest category king in our area and they're selling on results. Don't listen to us. Listen to him. And it, it raises, the, I guess, a bigger question around what some of the, whether it's franchises or, or independents, they, it can be hard to change people's mindset around principles of, of who they want in their gym and who they've always had. Because a lot of these gyms, mate, they've actually made a good living the, the first few years of opening up in the, in the late 2010s, 2015 through to 20, doing exactly what we're saying that you shouldn't be doing. But here we are, 2024, and a quote we use quite a lot, chickens have come home to roost. And it's, it's, just, not, it's just not happening anymore. Because yeah. all, all of those people that have been through your facility they're, they're probably not coming back because they're trying the other nine similar but slightly different programs that are in your area within two, three, four kilometers of, of yours. Yeah. And if you own a successful gym in 2013, it actually means nothing. No, nothing at all. If I owned Video Easy in 2006, would you come to me to coach you on how to start a streaming company? I hope not. Probably not. Yeah, we, we saw we saw this because we we've always marketed to beginners, sold to beginners, you know, as we as we preach. When we bought the gym that I was talking about referenced earlier, five years ago, we took over from that gym that had a small amount of clients, but they were very much these types of people, the, these fickle people who were in shape, they were fit, they could go into any similar group training program and feel comfortable. They, they had good movement, they were fit, they were strong, they were confident. The last owner done a great job with those 30 to 50 people, not enough to sustain a healthy business, but that's neither here nor there. Those people were wanting something specific from us that we, we just weren't willing to provide. And then moving forward, as we started to bring more and more of these other people into the program, they realized this isn't for them and that's okay. And then they moved on. And now we're on the path that we always have been where we are getting people in who wouldn't be going anywhere else but we saw it firsthand people asking about programs hey when are you going to be doing power cleans like <laughs> like what why don't why don't we why don't we do we haven't done wall climbers for a while why don't why don't we do muscle up progressions anymore and it's like well if you want to do muscle up progressions you can go to that crossfit gym up the road that's got 40 members but the doors will be closed there in two years speaking of the crossfit gym up the road mate where my partner ellen goes uh they do box step ups and as you know, being in the industry, mate, there's a certain way to do step ups and there's a certain way not to do step ups. And you have to plant one foot, twist perfectly around, and get your other leg down. And Ellen wasn't doing that correctly. And a member was very, very upset. Mm. That's yeah. the type of culture that you're creating in your gym if you are going after that 8%, the ones that actually care about the programming, the ones that break your shit, the ones that require more weights. Like it's just what you said is so important. And it's at a point in time, at a point in history, you could run a gym off those 8% when there was five gyms in a town of 1 million people. Unfortunately, now there's 100 gyms in a town of 1 million people. And you're all going after the 8%. It is a basic supply and demand thing. And if you are really going after the, the 8%, you probably need to have that multi-million dollar facility that has all the bells and whistles attached to it. Otherwise, people probably aren't going to give it much of a look in. And if you want to play that game, you're probably not listening to this podcast. <laughs> you've probably got you've probably yeah. got, got other people that you, you're getting mentoring off and, and listening to. But for, for the everyday person who isn't doing that, it's just it's just not a game you're gonna win. It, it's, no. it's it's simply not because there are these other companies that have millions and millions of dollars behind them. And just saying like that's above our pay grade. I don't know where the money comes from and I don't know what their end game is, but they will, they will outspend you until you're gone. So it's just, well, if you sit back and think, okay, well, I, I cannot compete with these guys for these, for these reasons. I can't compete with their facility. I can't compete with their equipment. I can't compete with their marketing budget. I can't compete with their location, their pricing, any of that stuff. And it's like, well, what's the obvious thing to do? I need to try to market and sell to different people who wouldn't go into this place. And for us, maybe that's, that's something that we've always thought was very obvious and very simple. But we have these conversations with people and we're doing this podcast right now talking about it. Maybe it's not quite as, as simple or obvious as, as we have always thought it was. And last thing on this before we, before we move on, but pe people, when they, they talk about, oh, what's good about your facility? Oh, the community's good. 
you know, we welcome everybody, like, you know, et cetera. So you're not, you're not rude to your members. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, that sort of stuff is, is the bare minimum. That That's what you, you need to do. It's like saying, oh, I walk into a restaurant, yeah, it's clean. You better <laughs> fucking hope it's clean like you're a restaurant. So it's yeah. it's, it's kind of like they're, they're stating things that are a bare minimum for, for entry. So then beyond that, it's like, well, why are you truly different? And if you can't answer that question, that's when you're, you're not going to be able to actually ask. If a prospect was to ask you, like, why should I join your facility? And you're crapping on about community, which is the, the same other 12 gyms that they've inquired at are saying the same thing. You're not going to stand out and they're not going to want to come in. And just by the way, mate, we are not finishing this podcast. I'm just getting started here. Here's some food for thought. If you had this massive facility in a Westfield or this beautiful commercial studio that requires you to have 300 members to be profitable. And what I mean by profitable is taking $100,000 a year. I mean, that's you're working in the business full time, taking 100K out. You need 300 members for that. I've got some math for you that I think everyone should hear. At 300 members, your churn rate is going to be 10% because that's a lot of members. Therefore, you're losing 30 members per month. Therefore, to replace those members, you need to have about 45 new trials every single month. Therefore, to get 45 new trials, you need to generate about 250 leads a month. That's 3,000 leads a year. If your lease is five years, that's 15,000 fucking leads in a town of 50,000 people. You need one in three people to opt in to become a lead. And you need them to convert into a trial or, or you could have a nice small facility with a hundred members paying 66, 76, 86 a week, be super duper profitable and reduce every single layer of complexity in your business that requires a facility with 300 members. There's a better way. Even with half that churn, 5%, which is, would be amazing. And you still need half as many leads. That's still not not viable. Still not no. viable. And I've I've got a bit of a take on this, which I do bring up with you whenever we talk about this sort of stuff. And I've fallen victim to it. But I listen to a lot of podcasts and and YouTube about different things and gym related, fitness related stuff. A lot of what I listen to is American. And what I overlook sometimes is that America has fifteen times the people Australia does. <laughs> Like 350 or 370 million or something like that. 54 million in California, 107 million in Texas. Right. So so they're, they're talking about these gyms that, that are profitable at 150 people, and that may very well be possible over there. I don't know. I've been there. I've holidayed there plenty of times, but I, I don't know what it's like in certain towns. But that may be possible because of the number of people there. Here in Australia, with one fifteenth the population, those numbers just do not make sense. There's just not, there is simply just not enough people for you to churn through to make that work. So instead of trying to make it profitable at 300, like to Jamie's point, you need to make that number a lot less, keep your expenses low, get your price up high. And at that point, you are able to, to turn a good profit, run a good service, get people results, have a good community, all those things that we want. But something that is actually sustainable here in Australia with, although it still is. 28 million or whatever but if you compare it to all these other countries in the world where there's you know 10x times that then like america i should say sorry 15 times that then you are really fighting this battle that is why people only last the industry for three years or one lease because they go through everybody they go through everybody and they need 200 members to, to turn a profit and as per those numbers you need a stupid amount of leads and trials and new members each month to keep up. And it just, you just run, you literally just run out of people. And we did this. We'd learned our lesson the hard way. 509 members. We lost 280 in like a four month period. We did it. We made every single mistake in the book. And I'll say it again. If you had a successful fitness business in 2013 and you're basing your model of success off that 11 years, a pandemic that was before Instagram, <laughs> like the world's changed and the businesses need to change with it. And, and, and the reason why I'm so passionate, mate, it breaks our hearts because I speak to more gym owners than maybe anyone in Australia at the moment. 
and I we have them fill out an application and I see their application, I see their member number, I see their profit, and some of them are just, they're in a bad, bad way. And it's not because they haven't got enough members, it is the structure of the business itself. They only serve people aged 18 to 25 in a town of 50,000 people. They've been open four years and they can't get leads. They've already come and they've already gone. And the nature of what fitness is, regardless of how good your service is, is quite, and obviously you have people return, but quite often people just won't ever come back. It's a feeling of embarrassment because they've left and maybe they ghosted you on the way out. It's a feeling that they've left and put on weight and they, if they come back, you're going to laugh in their face because they put on 20 kilos, whatever the reason is, okay? And obviously when, when you know us owners and trainers aren't like that, but maybe there is a bit of anxiety around coming back, but you, you just aren't going to get those or at least many of those people back. And obviously you've got new people moving to a town and, and every, every city is different you know, for different reasons. But what worked for us as per our last episode, what worked for us in 2016 and 17, just it, it, it didn't work in 2019. Mate, I want to give a massive shout out to Punch Love Boxing. Three locations, 700 members, 27 staff in 2024. They're the real MVPs. They're the real people that should be franchising. And who do they go after? Absolute beginners. The outdoor club, Chris Hennessy, 200 members in the park. Who does he go after? You're being led up the wrong tree and you're blatantly being lied to. All right, we might leave it there, I think. I'm going to have to rename this podcast, mate. <laughs> went, off, went off on a bit of a tangent. But if we go back to all the way, last thing I promise, mate, then we'll go. If we go back to the first part one, if you're marketing to people age 18 to 25 that are in high demand, you're trying to sell to people that age 18 to 25 in high demand, every single gym in town is going after those people. It is no wonder why your sales and marketing is becoming more and more difficult the longer that you're open outside of your pre-sale window. Therefore, maybe, perhaps, potentially, you could look at marketing towards people that aren't in gyms, people that are a little bit older. Why are their gyms shutting down everywhere? I don't know. Why? Because they're all trying the same shit. It's yeah, all the same they shit. Like, they're all trying the exact same stuff, and it's not working anymore. They call the 